God. Are you getting ready for the Feast of Tabernacles? You know, that's what it symbolizes. The Feast of Tabernacles is coming up uh, in a few months, October 9th to 16th. You know, are you planning your trip to uh, celebrate uh, God's coming millennium and your place in the kingdom of God? Are you, when Jesus Christ returns to rule this world and... <laughs> And with, a, you know, he's going to have a, the symbols of authority, this rod of iron, and he's going to rule with justice. Are you getting ready for this? Are you, are you ready? Are you packing your bags? Well, as you pack your bags, I'd like you to think about one of the, some of the things you need to take as you prepare to go to the kingdom of God. You need to think about gratitude and thankfulness. Now, some people may be saying, what, the kingdom of God is coming? <laughs> you know, is the kingdom of God coming? Well, what is the state of this world? Well, brethren, as we look at this world, you know, even as I look at the headlines today, what? There is this plane was shot down in eastern Ukraine. Oh, close to 50 people were killed in this. All the unsettlement between what Russia wants over Ukraine and what the West wants over Ukraine, this is not solved, not even close. And Russia's just not going to let, uh, you know, the NATO take over and put their missiles and all this other stuff in the, in the Ukraine. They're not going to allow it. We have problems and it's going to continue. And how about what's going on in the Middle East? A decade of American foreign policy is unraveling right before our eyes. They have spent a trillion dollars and, you know, they recorded something like 4,500 dead, just in the American dead. Who knows how many tens of thousands injured in all the fighting that have taken place in, in Iraq and what's even what's going on in Afghanistan. It's been like you were watching before our very lives. It's like American foreign policy was like, you know, trying to dip your finger in the sea and yet change things or building a sand castles on the shore of the beach. And when the tide comes in, it washes it all away. Stability in the Middle East is hanging by a thread. Status quo is changing. These few, it's, they, you know, they talk about the relatively small numbers, three to 5,000 fighters of ISIS, this extreme Al-Qaeda you know, um, uh, group of Islamic fighters. <laughs> They're taking over vast swaths of, of Iraq and they've, they've got their hold, the grip on most of the Sunni areas of Iraq. Will they take Baghdad? Well, people are scrambling. The price of oil is up. Iran is saying they're going to help. They're going, you know, all they need is a request, you know, and we will do it according to international law. So they'll get along. And meanwhile, the United States and Iran are meeting in secret in Switzerland, you know, trying to make a little deal of their own, you know, whatever. Probably selling Israel down the, you know, down the river, you know, while the Iranians feverishly work on developing their atomic bombs. Brother, and this is the world we're living in. And you know, the, where the price of oil, the price of oil hits $120, you're going to know this. Or if it hits $140, what's going to happen to the economy? It's going to tank. It's going to tank. You know, they're trying to say that we are having a recovery, but it's hanging by a very a thread. And it's mostly, you know, there's a lot of PR putting, yeah, we're moving forward. Yeah, we're recovering. It's, it's like cheerleading. And it's not really happening. The new normal is not normal. <laughs> Rather, the new normal is not normal. And we are living in a world that's getting ready for some big shakes, some big changes. And we need to be ready for the kingdom of God. And as I said, if we're going to get ready for the kingdom of God, we have to think about packing gratitude and thankfulness. Turn with me now. I want you to open your Bibles. You know, get out the, the Bible, this, this book that in many parts of Iraq would get you, uh, you know, your head chopped off. Okay, you sit there and you, somebody found out I was reading or preaching like on the Sabbath day right now. Those ISIS fighters would come in and just put a bullet right in my head. You know, we, we are living in a dangerous times, brethren. Things are changing. But we still have freedom and we still have the relative peace in the areas that we are and much of the Western world to go forward, even if, it, if we continue as a, as a world to, to disintegrate and our moral standards are just evaporating right before our eyes in, the, in these Western worlds. 
What is, a, what is coming for us, though, in the Church of God, brethren, for you and for me? Let's take a look here. You open your Bibles here to Revelation chapter 7 and verse 1. I want you to see something here. Now, after this, you know, of course, we're breaking into the Revelation in chapter 7, breaking into the story here. After this, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, restraining the four winds of the earth so that no wind could blow on the earth or the sea or any living tree. See, God has his time, and sometimes he holds back events. And I have felt here for a while that God has been holding back events. I really have. He's been slowing things down according to what he wants done. But things aren't stopping either. But he's, he's, he's slowed things down a little bit that we haven't quite had the kind of crisis that will eventually hit us. It's Because it, once these things start happening, preaching the gospel is going to get much more difficult. So the, these four angels... We're standing on the four corners of the earth, restraining the four winds of the earth, so no wind could blow on the earth or sea or any tree. Then I saw another angel that had the seal of the living God rise up from the east. Oh yes, Jerusalem is in the east. And he cried out in a loud voice to the four angels who were empowered to harm the earth and the sea, don't harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we seal the slaves of our God on their foreheads. The slaves of our God. Sometimes, because, you know, like they, some versions will put it, the servants of our God or this, this sort of thing. But these are people who are bought. They're owned by God. They're part of his household. To Because the idea is don't harm them till we seal the servants or the slaves of our God on their foreheads. This is to spare them from harm. I want you to turn with me now to see something here very quickly. Let's go back to the prophet Ezekiel. I want you to see you know, how God uses this. He's, he's using this symbol, you know, this symbol here. He pulled it, to, you know, he gave this vision to John and he pulled it right out of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 9. See, God's consistent in what he has and what he shows. Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 4. Ezekiel 9 and verse 4. And here's another. And <clears throat> Anyways, there was, he called the man clothed in linen with a rider's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said to him, verse 4, Go through the midst of the city in the midst of Jerusalem, in the midst of what should have been God's people, in the midst of his congregation, those who were called to be saints, and set a mark on the foreheads of the men who are groaning and who are mourning because of all the abominations that are done in her midst. See, Jerusalem at that time was morally corrupt, just like our societies here in Canada and the United States of America are morally corrupt. Are you sighing? Are you mourning? Are you groaning because of when you read these things in your daily news and you hear of how our society is turning its back on every value that God holds precious? Teaching against it, promoting those things that are evil. That's our nature of our society. It may be shocking to say that, but that we've fallen that far in the Western world. It's not surprising that the enemies of the West are rising up. God is allowing them to be stirred up. People like this ISIS group who are <laughs> absolute barbarians and violent and vicious people, they are stirred up and they are fired up. A few of thousands of them routing the Iraqi army in just days. Amazing. How could this happen? Well, it happens because the blessing and the covering that God has provided us in the Western world and the status quo of this dominance of the United States and this Pax Americana since World War II is fast evaporating. And things are changing, brethren. Be ready. Things are changing. In verse 3, and he said to those in my hearing, go through the city after him, after this man who had the inkhorn, who was going to set a mark on the foreheads of the men who were groaning because of the moral degradation of their people, of the holy people. 
And he said, go through him in my hearing, go through the city after him and slaughter. Let your eye not spare, nor have pity. Fully destroy old men, young men, virgins, and little children and, and women. But do not come near any man on, on whom is the mark. And begin at my sanctuary. And they began with the old men who were before the temple. And he said to them, Defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. And they went out and slaughtered in the city. Because God was going to pour out his fury on Jerusalem. He really was. Let's go back here to Revelation 7. Okay, we'll Go back here to Revelation chapter 7. And verse 3, don't harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we seal the slaves of our God on their forehead. You know, there's something else that this marks in this whole thing of Ezekiel 9 and verse 4 to 6 is where it's talking about where do we begin? Was this just an, an old covenant thing? Or does God have a way of responsibility that he holds closely and as always of those who worship him? Well, let's take a look here. Let's, let's, take, uh, uh, let's take a new covenant reference for this. Let's go to the book of First Peter, the epistle that the apostle Peter wrote to the 12 tribes of Israel scattered in the dispersion. This is the way he puts it. First Peter, let's see here. First Peter chapter four and verse seven, uh, verse 17. 1 Peter 4, 17. God inspired the apostle Peter to say this to the church of God, to the brethren. He said, For the time has come for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it first begins with us, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous are saved with much difficulty, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? These are sober words for us to think about. These are sobering times for us to realize that we live in. The time of what we've known of peace and abundance is fading. It is fading. It's going to be replaced with something else. So if we go back to Revelation, Revelation chapter 7 and verse 4, so don't seal, don't harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we seal the servants of our God. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of every tribe of the Israelites. Okay, that was current events. It wasn't something that happened in the past. It was something that when this finally comes to pass, that the time is arrived, you know, modern time, 144,000. Let's drop down here to verse 9. I'm reading here in the Holman Christian Standard Bible. And after this, I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which not one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were robed in white, with white, with palm branches in their hands. Okay, the symbol here, the palm branches in their hands, is like uh, directly from the Feast of Tabernacles. And I started, you know, have you got your bags packed? Are you ready to go to the Feast of Tabernacles? Well, this is the symbol of what they've had. This is what the, it's, it's the, of what goes on in this typical thing of coming to the place of worship with the palm branches. This is a symbol of the Feast of Tabernacles. This is what used to happen in the old days, okay? Verse 10, and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell face down before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Let it be blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving. We're going to come back to this. And honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Let it be. Then one of the elders asked me, Who are these people robed in white and where do they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. Okay. The Apostle John has got the right answers here. You know, he's not going to speculate. He's, Sir, you know, you know, he's not going to stick his neck out, as it were. You know where they've come from? Then he told me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. 
For this reason, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his sanctuary. The one seated on the throne will shelter him. See, look at, the, look at what's the benefit of the saints, those who are there, who are redeemed among all of mankind, who are there before the throne of God, that the one seated on the throne will shelter them. They will no longer hunger. They will no longer thirst. The sun will no longer strike them, nor will any heat. For the lamb who is at the center of the throne will shepherd them. You know, these whole things of using this analogy of, of hunger and that he had thirst and the sun no longer striking him. I couldn't help but think when I looked at all the refugees that are fleeing from before ISIS, these Islamic fundamentalists, you know, there they are. You look at the, you look at the video of this. There they are in the desert and they're having to buy their water. Okay, every little, every little bottle of water, whatever resources they have, and the heat is just beating down on them. If you haven't been to the Middle East and don't know how hot it can get, and then they're getting into summer, you know, the full summer, it gets it broiling in those places. It really does. It's, it's, this is, these, it's like, you know, it's like God is saying these people have been through the refugee experience when they've been hungry, when they've been thirsty when they've been physically discomforted in every possible way. Verse 17, For the Lamb who is at the center of the throne will shepherd them. He will guide them to the springs of living waters. It's eternal life. That's a symbol of eternal life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So in Revelation 712 here, as I just said, amen and blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving. Revelation 12, you know, talks about those who are before God's throne giving thanksgiving. Thanksgiving here in this word here, in Revelation 712, is the word Eucharistia. Ah, Eucharistia. Think about that. That's an interesting word. The interesting uh, Greek word is thankful for God's grace. Properly thankfulness, thanksgiving, literally, the giving of thanks for God's grace. A short definition, thankfulness or gratitude. You know, it is Eucharistia. Those who are before God's throne give Eucharistia. Let's take a look here. Let's just go back here a little bit in Revelation. Let's go to, just turn back here to Revelation chapter 4. I want you to look at Revelation chapter 4. It's good for us to refresh these things in our head have these things in our minds. After these things I looked, and behold, the door opened in heaven. See, things are not always as they seem. There's a spiritual reality, and there's a material reality. Many of the secular people of this world just think the material reality is all there is. The revelation and what is different, why we are different is because we believe in God's revelation. God has a revelation that is the truth the ultimate, the spiritual truth. Because the spirit, be it though this material world, it rests and depends upon the spiritual. The material came from the spirit. God said the word and it was created. But anyways, I looked at these things and behold, the door opened in heaven and the first voice that I heard was as if a trumpet was speaking with me. It must have been interesting, you know, it's, it's almost like this digital, this remarkable sound that you could come up with. We might be able to develop at this point in time with our technology to have something to sound like that, saying, come up here and I will show you the things that must take place after these things. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, the throne was set in heaven and one was sitting on the throne. We're going to have this image of God on his throne, this incredible image. And he was sitting, was in appearance like a jasper stone, sort of reddish, and a sardinia stone, and a rainbow was around the throne like an emerald in its appearance, sitting on an emerald, shining emerald, jade almost throne. And around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments, and they had on their heads golden crowns. 
and proceedings from the throne were lightnings, and proceeding from the throne were lightnings and thunders and voices and seven lamps of fire, which are the seven spirits of God, were burning before the throne. And before the throne was a sea of glass like crystal, and around the throne and over the throne were four living creatures full of eyes before and behind. It's an incredible vision. Incredible vision for, for, for a man to try to understand what he was seeing. John is doing the best he can. <laughs> it's an amazing thing, brethren. It is an amazing thing, the throne room of God. And the first living creature was like a lion, and the second living creature was like a bull, and the third living creature had the face of a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. You know, from all these things, the spiritual reality we have, physical correspondence that were made. Interesting. And each of the four living creatures had six wings respectively. Sort of like some of these things that we see from the ancient Middle East where they'd have these winged bulls and things like this. Think about this. Where did these things come from? Where did the ancients, how did they come up with these ideas? Had six wings respectively and around and within were full of eyes and day and night they ceased not saying holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanksgiving, Eucharistia, to him who sits on the throne who lives into the ages of eternity. You see, even those who are before the throne room of God, these spiritual creatures, they're giving thanksgiving, Eucharistia, they're thankful for God's grace before his throne. Now, there's an ancient human proverb that says, it's forbidden to taste of this world without saying a blessing. It's an ancient Jewish proverb. And they tried to show that if anything, you know, what, what, this, this parable that if we receive something good in the society, we should be willing to express gratitude and thanksgiving for it. Because it's from heaven. You know, it's from God's throne, as it were, who, and the gift of God to, to the earth and to humanity that we should have these good things, that we can enjoy a quiet mind and all of the good things that God gives us in this life. We should show sincere appreciation and gratitude for it, for the good things that touch our lives, the opportunities we have to grow, to learn, to express, to love, to care. You know, all these things are good, and God expects us to show gratitude and appreciation for them. Brethren, this is not a time <laughs> where people express a lot of gratitude and appreciation and thankfulness. I mean, we have our Thanksgiving days. Yeah, and in many ways you say, well, why are you speaking about this now? Well, brethren, we need to think about this. And all things in our life, if periodically we need to think about, are we showing gratitude and, th and appreciation and thankfulness to God for the things he gives us? Are we doing that? Are we thinking about the, uh, you know, or do we appreciate the promises of the world to come? See, right now, life in this world is pretty good for most people in the West. And we're not thinking, well, we need a world to come. We need, you know, promises of God. We can do just fine. You know, everything's just great right now. Why do we need God? Why do we need these things? Well, brethren, these things are ephemeral, you know. They really are. How long will we have these things? You know, here in, in British Columbia this past week, you know, there's a private uh, evangelical Christian university in this province known as Trinity Western University. They have an undergree program and they have some graduate programs and they wanted to bring in a law school. It's a private university, not publicly funded. It's a private university. But you know, they're having a tremendous amount of problems in, here in Canada of, of being accredited of having different provinces being willing to take their graduates and allow them to article to begin their, you know, after they graduate, to recognize them as lawyers, to be able to work in law offices, because that's what young lawyers, to want to be lawyers, have to do. But they don't want them to be, because they have, Trinity Western University has a conservative community covenant that says that sexual relations are between a man and a woman and, you know, married man and a woman. 
Yeah, it's not just, I mean, they go after fornication too, heterosexual, much less, you know, homosexual. And of course, the people who are really upset about this are the homosexuals, not so much the fornicators. <laughs> <laughs> the fornicators keep their news to themselves, okay, from that standpoint. But they don't want them to have them allow that. You know, they're saying here it's going to probably go to the Supreme Court, you know, because, you know, they'll say, the, you know, the people who represent the homosexual point of view said, all right, they can have religious freedom. It's in, it's in our charter of rights here in Canada, religious freedom to believe. Ah, but to practice? That's a different matter because they want to say that their freedom to have whatever they want and to force everybody to agree to it trumps is a higher freedom and they should be allowed to do whatever they want to do. I mean, is, they want that they, that they, on a private university, to speak out. You see, the, why is this important? Because most people who run the government are, have a background in law. It's very important. But for years and years, things are changing. You know, do we appreciate the promises that God has given us of his kingdom that is going to come, the promises of appearing and worshiping before his throne? There is a statement, there's a little, there's a little expression by a man named William Arthur Ward who said, feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping up a present and not giving it. Do we express our gratitude to God? I just showed you, even the spiritual beings in heaven express their gratitude to God, show their appreciation, their Eucharistia. I mean, this, these things appearing when they appear before God, they appear, the, the saints. All these people coming out of the tribulation appear with thanksgiving, Eucharistia, before God. Let's turn to Psalm 50. Let's take a look at Psalm 50. I'm going to read Psalm 50 um, mostly in the New Living Translation. One verse, uh, verse 5, I'm going to actually switch to the ESV and H, uh, the Holman Christian Standard Bible. And, you know, it's the same in the Coulter, too, because New Living doesn't uh, get it right. But anyways... Um, but anyways, we, we want to think about, in Psalm 50, is talking about how this psalm is how the Bible's God considers that gratitude and the giving of thanks are the real substance of his worship, of those who to worship the true God, the God of the Bible. It's a psalm of Asaph. So verse 1 here. The Lord, the Mighty One, is God, and he has spoken. He has summoned all humanity from where the sun rises in the east to where it sets. From Mount Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines in glorious radiance, just like we were reading about in Revelation 4. Our God approaches and he is not silent. Fire devours everything in his way and a great storm rages around him. He calls on the heavens above and the earth below to witness the judgment of his people. Verse 5, bring my faithful people. Coulter has, bring my saints to me. Those who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Bring my people, my faithful people, my saints, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Yeah, I like, kind of like the way the, the message, which is more of a paraphrase, puts it. He says, round up my saints who swore on the Bible their loyalty to me. And that's what we've done in the church of God. Oh yes, there are many who have fallen away from us over the years. But, you know, for all the things that we've been tested, in the last 20 years, 30 years, you know, it's all it says who are, who's loyal, who's proving, who's thankful for the promises God's given. Verse 6, then let the heavens proclaim his justice for God himself will judge. Think about that. Oh, my people, listen as I speak. Here are my charges against you, O Israel. I am God, your God. I have no complaint about your sacrifices or the burnt offerings you continually offer. Okay, you have all these things in the temple. You're doing all this, okay? The, you know, the Levitical sacrifices. You're, okay, you're doing it. 
you're, you're doing all this. I, I'm, that's not my complaint. I don't, but, but you know, he says, verse 9, I don't need the bulls from your barns or the goats from your pens. Come on, that's not really the point of all this. For all the animals of the forest are mine, and I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I mean, what's your couple, you know, what are a couple of animals that you're bringing to me? God is saying to them. I know every bird on all the mountains and all the animals in the field are mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't have to tell you. For all the world is mine and everything in it. Do I eat the meat of bulls or do I drink the blood of goats? You know, God is a spiritual being. He doesn't need physical sustenance. Verse 14. Make thankfulness your sacrifice to God, he was saying to them in Psalm 50. Make thankfulness your sacrifice and keep the vows you made to the Most High. Keep your word, keep your commitments. Verse 15, then call on me when you are in trouble and I will rescue you and you will give me glory. Pop down here to verse 23 to the, towards the end. But giving thanks is a sacrifice that truly honors me. If you keep my path, I will reveal to you the salvation of God. Yes, the giving of thanks is one of those things that God <laughs> revealed in Revelation. That even the spiritual beings, you know, the, the, the living creatures, the elders, this is what they do before God. They are appreciative of what, of what he's, they have gratitude for what God is doing for them. The saints that come, those that are purified, the 144,000, the innumerable multitude that come out of all the tribulation before God, they come with thanksgiving, appreciation, gratitude. Now, we might ask a question, you know, because again, the, the Asaph said here, for those uh, in verse 5, uh, bring my faithful people, those who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Okay, have we made a covenant with God by sacrifice? All right, let's, let's just check. Let's go to Luke 22, verse 19. Luke 22, verse 19. See, God has a way of operating and he's consistent. He's spiritually consistent. Luke twenty two nineteen, And he took bread and gave thanks, and he broke it and gave it to them and said, This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after the supper and said, This cup is the new covenant established by my blood. It is shed for you. The old covenant was ratified, as it were, by the blood of bulls and goats, animals, okay? But the new covenant, it's by Christ's blood. It's not something we offer. The sacrifice he wants from us is Eucharistus. It's this thanksgiving. It's a gratitude and appreciation. We don't just take it for granted. You know, again, if we don't express gratitude for something like this, it's like not giving a gift. We, we might feel it, but we don't express it. New covenant here, the word new, and I just want to re refresh this, is it's, it means, you know, we, most versions will translate it the new covenant, but it means the refreshed covenant. The Greek word is kainos. It's refreshed because it's not exactly like it was before. It was fresh. It is fresh with new opportunity. See, it's a covenant that can bring us actually before the throne of God. And God said, was saying there, he will be our shepherd. He's not going to let us suffer the things that we might go through in this life. Yes, life in this world, I don't know if you, you probably already know it, life in this world is oftentimes lumpy and it's not fair. If you haven't experienced it, I'm, you know, Give thanks that you haven't, uh, that things have not been unfair for you. But it is oftentimes both lumpy and unfair. That's the nature of it. You know this, what Luke 22 and verse 19 here, this, the bread and the, this whole passage on, the, on, the, on my body and on his blood and, this, and the, the, the new covenant, the refreshed covenant being established. This whole thing of Jesus' Last Supper, the ceremony of the bread and wine, 
is, of course, what we practice every year in the Church of God, as we call the, the New Covenant Passover ceremony. Some people call it the Last Supper. I prefer the terminology that's the New Covenant Passover. In the Greek church, they called it the Eucharist, meaning gratitude. We take it and we take it in gratitude and thankfulness. Because, <laughs> well, why? Well, because of what it has done for us. It has healed us of all our sins and the consequences of those sins, which is going to be death. We need to remember to show our gratitude and our appreciation to God, our thankfulness. It's important. Let's go to Luke 17. Luke 17, Luke chapter 17 and verse 11. And we'll start here, Luke 17, 11. I'm going to read this one in the Kazir translation. I, I like Kazir here. At one time, when in the course of his journey, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the course of his journey to Jerusalem, he was traveling along the border between Samaria and Galilee, verse 12, and was entering a certain village. He encountered ten men who were lepers, and they took up their stand at a considerable distance and, raising their voice, exclaimed, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When his eyes fell on them, he addressed them with the words, These men who were lepers, remember, they were the outcasts of society. They weren't allowed in to normal places. They had to, you know, sleep outside the villages. People would throw them scraps of food. They had lost everything, you know, because of their disease. Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When his eyes fell on him, he addressed them with these words, go off and present yourself to the priest. Okay, citing, of course, that what was in the scriptures in Leviticus 13. And while they were on their way, lo and behold, they were cleansed. And one among them, realizing that he had been healed, turned back giving praise to God at the top of his voice, and he threw himself at Jesus' feet to express his gratitude to him. And the man was a Samaritan. That time he was a despised minority. You know, a despised minority, an outcast from the Jewish community as far as they were concerned. Just like the Sunnis, you know, the Isis, you know, considers the, uh, the, uh, the Shiites to be heretical and the Christians to be dogs and the Jews to be worse than dogs. I don't know, whatever, their hierarchy of hates, you know, from this thing. But at that point in time, Samaritans were, you know, considered by the general community of the Jewish people to be dogs, you know. This man that threw himself at Jesus' feet to express his gratitude to him, and he was, he was the Samaritan. Verse 17, in response to this, Jesus explained, how is this? Were not ten men cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was not even one of them found returning back to give thanks to God? Not one among them did except this man of alien descent. The rest were Jews, and they didn't bother. They couldn't be bothered to give thanks to God for such an incredible gift. What were they thinking? Were they thinking, oh, hey, I'm healed. I can go back and grab all my stuff, pick up my life. Was not even one among them found returning back to give thanks to God? Not one of them did, except this man of alien descent, the Samaritan. Verse 19, then he turned to the man and said, Rise up and be on your way. It is your faith that has given you back your health. You know, I remember once talking with a church member about how blessed I was and having the opportunity to support the work of God, the church of God, and those who were in need. But this church brother who I was talking with said, you know, he, he wasn't, he wasn't paying, 
10 cents and a tithe from that point until he had bought all his new dining room set of furniture. <laughs> he wasn't, you know, he wasn't going to help out. He wasn't going to do his share because he didn't have everything he wanted yet. He wanted, you know, new table. I was shocked. I was shocked. <laughs> a Greek philosopher by the name of Epictetus put it this way. He says, he is a wise man who does not grieve for the things that he has not, but rejoices for those he has. Yeah, you may not have in the church of God all the goodies. Maybe you're not driving the newest car. You're not doing some of these things. You know, you don't have the biggest house like the 1% the trophy wife or husband or whatever it might be. You may not have the, you know, the big job you want. Yeah, it's sometimes, yes, there are some things. Yeah, we, you know, you have to turn down work, jobs, or things that conflict with the Sabbath or the holy days, or, you know, moral values. <laughs> I would hope none of you would consider the occupation of a stripper or that your daughter is a good career for her to be a prostitute. I mean, prostitution is legal. Right now the state is just here in Canada, they're trying to figure out how they can extract the maximum amount of tax out of this, but it's, you know, they're, they're just dickering her with us in the mean point in time while people's lives are being destroyed. Let's go to Philippians 3. Yes, we may not get everything material we want in this in this life, but does it really matter? Does it really matter? A lot of people says it really does. And some people who've been among us and in the church of God, you know, when they leave, they say, hey, you know, I start making all this extra money. I get this job I want. I get this, all this other stuff. I get this, you know, a new wife that I, you know, I got rid of the old one and got a new one. I've heard people say this stuff. I've literally heard people say this stuff. It's so great, they say. They weren't really thankful, Eucharistia, or they didn't have gratitude for what God had offered them spiritually. Philippians 3 and verse 8, I'm going to read this in the Amplified Version. The Apostle Paul speaking. Yes, furthermore, I count everything as loss compared to the possession of the priceless privilege the overwhelming preciousness, the surpassing worth, the supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord and of progressively becoming more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, of perceiving and recognizing and understanding him more fully and clearly. For his sake I have lost everything, the Apostle Paul said and consider it all to be mere rubbish. <laughs> Garbage, refuse, excrement, dung, the way the King James Bible puts it, in order that I may gain Christ, the anointed one. Yes, does it really matter if we don't get everything material that we want in this life? Because there's a cost to being a member of the Church of God. His response to God's revelations and, and His promises towards us, His love towards us, how can we express our gratitude to Him? You know, how do we actually give thanks in a way that He would appreciate? You know, oftentimes, you know, when you give a gift of thanksgiving, it's, it's, it's something like this. It's, it's, it's appropriate to the, to the individual, right? Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 1. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 1. I'll stay here with the Amplified. It's a little longer read, but it pulls out the meaning, you know. It gives us all the colors and shades of the, of the text here. But as to the suitable times and precise seasons and dates, brethren, you have no necessity for anything being written to you. Or what I've spoken to. I'm sure most of you are, are understand and know these things. You know where we're sliding, you know, morally in, in our nations. 
you see in the, in the newspapers or on the TVs or on the internet what's going on. The United States is, you know, being humiliated. For you yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the return of the Lord will come as unexpectedly and suddenly as a thief in the night. When people are saying all is well and secure and there is peace and safety, then in a moment, unforeseen destruction, ruin and death will come upon them as suddenly as labor pains come upon a woman with child and they shall by no means escape and there will be no escape. This is what's going to happen. See, you will wake up one day and you'll find the U.S. dollar is practically worthless, if not all completely worthless. Our money. This is going to happen. It will happen. The people in Baghdad or the people in Mosul when they heard that ISIS was coming, what, you know, they grabbed what they essentially needed to keep alive on the road and maybe some possessions or money if they had to buy something and hit the road like that. They went out of there, 300, 400, 500,000. Some of them are drifting back because Life under ISIS couldn't be worse than sitting in a refugee camp, baking in a tent. And they figured out, you know, whatever. So now you have to walk around the women in tents and, you know, the guys have to do this and that. So when they are saying all is well and secure there is, and there is peace and safety, then in a moment unforeseen destruction. And they shall by no means escape. There will be no escape. Verse 4, but you were not given up to the power of darkness, Paul's saying to the brethren, for that day to overtake you by surprise like a thief, for you are all sons of the light and sons of the day, and we do not belong either to the dark or the night. Accordingly then, let us not sleep as the rest do, but let us keep wide awake. That's alert, that's cautious that's on our guard, and let us be sober. That's, you know, calm, collected, circumspect, cool, you know, not panicked. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night, but we belong to the day. Therefore, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love for a helmet for a, sal uh, for a hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, to incur his wrath. He hasn't appointed us to that. He didn't select us to, for condemnation, no, but that we might obtain his salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are still alive or are dead, at the point in time of Christ appearing, we might live together with him and share his life. Do we have Eucharistia for this? Are we thankful for this? Therefore, encourage one another and edify one another just as you are doing. Because I know, brethren, many of you do. And we all need a word of encouragement at a time. And that's something you can do to encourage each other. Because this life is oftentimes lumpy. And it is unfair. And it is hard. Verse 12, Now also we beseech you, brethren, get to know those who labor among you, you know, recognize them, the, the Amplified puts it for what they are, and acknowledge and appreciate and respect them all. Get to know those who labor among you. Show them gratitude and appreciation. You are leaders who are over you in the Lord and those who warn and kindly reprove and exhort you and hold them in very high and most affectionate esteem and appreciation of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we earnestly beseech you, brethren, to admonish those who are out of line. You know, the loafers, the disorderly, the unruly. And we have those that hang around the fringes of the church at all times or among us. Encourage the timid and the faint-hearted. Help and give your support to the weak souls. And be very patient with everybody. Keeping our temper is one of those things we have to do. 
Verse 15, see that none of you repays another with evil for evil, but always aim to show kindness and seek to do good to one another and to everybody. 16, be happy. Be happy in your faith and rejoice and be glad-hearted continually. Be unceasing in prayer. That's to pray with perseverance. Thank God in everything. No matter what the circumstances, be thankful and give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Thank God in everything. Because in all these things, the tribulations and the trials and the tests that we go through in this life, yet we know in the end we've come out the victors because of the promise that Christ has given us. Let's go to Ephesians. Let's go to another epistle of the Apostle Paul. He talked about, you know, how he, he didn't matter what he had to suffer or lose in the meantime for, the, the, for these precious promises. But he says this in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 4. Ephesians 5 and verse 4. I start with one. Therefore be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love. As the Messiah also loved us and gave himself for us a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. So that was his sacrifice. And then what is our sacrifice? But sexual immorality and any impurity or greed should not even be heard of among you as is proper for saints. See? we express our gratitude to, to God by changing our behavior. This is a novel thought for many people <laughs> these days. Coarse and few, foolish talking or crude joking are not suitable, but rather, what is suitable? Giving thanks, Eucharistia, thankfulness, gratitude. So how do we show to Christ our Eucharistia? Our thankfulness. Let's go to John 15, verse 13. He tells us very clearly. He expresses, you know, how we show our Eucharistia, our appreciation, our gratitude, our thankfulness. John 15, 13, in the New Living Translation, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. In verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command. See, lawlessness, anomia, being without law, being, you know, not listening to the words of the Bible, well, you can't be Christ's friend. We have to do. If we, if we, it's one of the ways we show our appreciation, our thankfulness, the sacrifice that God wants from us. He's not asking us to, you know, to, to, you know, to buy a goat or a bull or something like this or do this. He's not asking that. He's, he's asking us instead for other things. John 15, verse 16. Let's look at verse 16. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and appointed you that you might go and bear fruit and keep on bearing and that your fruit might be lasting. He wants us to produce those good fruits in our lives and so he can live his life through us to actually to be a blessing to other people. We show our thankfulness to God by, you know, being his servants, doing the things he would like in our lives to help others, to, to encourage others. It's a tall order. Let's go to 1 John 3.16. And I'll read the 1 John 3.16 in the Amplified. By this we know, and the Greek here means to progressively, to recognize, to perceive, to understand. You see, it's something we're growing in. By this we know the essential love that he laid down his own life for us and we ought to lay our lives down for those who are our brothers. These, this is what he's looking for. You know, what has Christ rec res uh, rescued us from? What has he promised us? It's an incredible promise. And do we have that appreciation? Do we show the gratitude, the thankfulness in the way that is fitting? Is it we're coming? You know, just as if from that standpoint we are healed from leprosy, a living death. And, and was, but it was only one out of ten. One out of ten, a tithe that came back to show 
is thankfulness to Christ. Only one out of ten rescued from a living death. Do you feel gratitude for Christ's work, his saving work, his guidance, his, 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 his leading our lives, his willingness to be our shepherd? To all the things he promised in Revelation 7. As a new covenant people of God, we should embrace those virtues that show thankfulness and gratitude as our way of life. Is everything we do, whether we give thanks when we eat, you know, how we, how we treat other people, how we encourage others in our lives, in our workplaces. And sometimes it's, it's, it's hard because oftentimes the people we work with are not very grateful and they're not thankful. Sometimes we have to be, you know, and teachers oftentimes find this. In a class of 30 kids, you know, there might be one, maybe two. If they're as lucky as Jesus, maybe one-tenth of the class will show gratitude. The others won't. It seems to, it seems to be, I mean, there's people saved from a living death, and, you know, nine-tenths of them could care less. They forget. But we've seen this in the Church of God, too. People have been healed of diseases, but their gratitude and their thankfulness does amount to a hill of beans. They treat, they beat, and they, you know, they swear, they do all the sorts of nasty things to other people in the church. I've seen that too. We live our appreciation, our thankfulness, to, and our gratitude to God. You know, it's a 24-7 walk, as Psalm 50 talks about it. We need to take time to think about how we show our gratitude to God. How we, how we do this directly and also in the responsibility that he gives us as his servants. The Matthew Henry commentary had an interesting point that they, they made on this about showing gratitude. It said, joy in God is of great consequence in the Christian life and Christians need to be again and again called to it for it more than outweighs all the causes of sorrow. A sense of thankfulness helps us to overcome in gratitude whatever the lumpiness that life, you know, the unfairness that might, might throw, throw at us. Our gratitude and thankfulness, our Eucharistia, should express itself to God because we appreciate, we value his mercy. We value his goodness. We value his faithfulness of his promises that what he has written he will bring to pass. And that's going to be the anchor of our souls in the times to come. We can depend on his providence. We should, we should be thankful and grateful for this kind of being our God, whom we have a relationship with. Let's close with, I want to close with this, brethren. Let's turn with me to Philippians 4 and verse 1. I'll read this in the um, English Standard Version, the ESV. Philippians 4 and verse 1. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Verse 5, let your reasonably, reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. Oh, there will be plenty to be anxious about. But Paul is saying, don't be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thankfulness. Eucharistia, let your requests be made known to God. Brethren, when you pack your bags for the kingdom of God, remember to pack also Eucharistia in there. Thankfulness and gratitude for all God is doing for you. Let's pray.